Uh, I just want to welcome Scott Fine to the stage right now. And, uh, Um, and I'd also like to invite another amazing individual, uh, Kirk Allen. Is Kirk around? He was here. Oh, he ran away? It's that bad, the movie? Yeah. Uh, is Hugh here? No, Hugh wasn't able to make it yet. There he is. There's Kirk. Come on on stage. So you got the three of us. Uh, but I would like to start off just by saying that um, when I started this project, I really had anxiety thinking every person I was going to meet uh, to interview uh, was going to be filled with bitterness and, and just anger uh, over what happened. But what I found is amazing individuals who took this awful thing that happened to them or this awful thing that they were involved in and really spinned it into something uh, that they could really reflect on for the rest of their lives and, and make the best off of it. Um, and I found it, especially with these two, uh, it's been a pleasure to really get to know them, and I thank both of you for being the people that you are. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll do some Q&A here if anybody has any questions. What, what, what might be helpful, before you ask a question, because this is to avoid the embarrassment, of course, of no one asking a question. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, but there's at least one person in the audience who shall remain nameless because I don't know their name who's saying, they ask him to show their hands. Why did they, I cannot believe that only a lawyer would turn this into a federal case and an artist into a film. They asked him to show their hands. But the, the, the broader context, br briefly, and it, it took some time to develop was that um, New York State has 62 college campuses uh, around the state, um, many of which were state teaching colleges and agricultural colleges. And um, about 40 percent of them are upstate in small communities like Oneonta. Uh, they were doing reasonably well until the late 80s or, and then early 1990s when they became, uh, previously they'd become part of the SUNY system, and they changed the budgeting requirement. The budgeting requirement was they were each on their own they had to generate their own revenue in order to exist. And what had happened was that admissions had flatlined. Um, people had, largely they were, they, were, they were harvesting from their own communities and kids were going elsewhere. They were just more mobile. So in an effort to make their budget numbers, because otherwise they would have to lay off staff, they began to recruit students from urban areas, uh, in particular New York City, because these students came with uh, often full state and federal subsidies. Um, so the students had intrinsic value. And Cheryl Champion, who was stopped at the bus, was working for the school. She was on her way down to the Bronx to recruit. Uh, in, a, in a way, it was, a, and, and I'm, to state it is to overstate it, but it always struck me as a form of slavery in the modern world where, where, where African Americans had intrinsic value and they were moved to the South. Well, these, these students, these youngsters were moved to Oneonta because of their intrinsic value. They, they brought tuition um, with them. That was, was fine, except that the small communities that had relatively small resident African American populations woke up after four years now, four years of bringing in students, and suddenly there were 200 and 300 African American males and females who were in their late teens, early 20s. And there was no effort to acclimate these small communities to this, as he referred to, transient population. So downtown, students would walk, People would say, the crime was committed, they did it. Women should not go out at night. It became, and it, you say to yourself, whose fault is it? Well, was it the state university's fault for trying? They said, no, we wanted kids to have an education. Was it the resident's fault for not knowing how to treat a minority population? Well, they never had experience. So when you, 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 you stand back, um, my, my wife isn't fond of, of when I say this, but, but uh, sometimes, um, there are victims 
and they're not always villains. And I, I found a hard time identifying villains sometimes, but this was happening all around New York State. So Oneonta was, was sort of emblematic. Every community with a small state school was having the same issues with respect to its minority population. The, the last comment I'm gonna make and then entertain questions as, as we're supposed to is that what had happened in a, in a global uh, perspective is when they started this investigation, they, it was a state, they went to the school, they got a list, they couldn't find a suspect, and over five days they approached every black male in town. So these were elderly black people who were not on the list. They wouldn't let them leave. And it had gotten so bad that as, as African Americans of all ages walked through the town of Oneonta, there were police cars just cruising up and down the streets. In order to prevent being stopped, and you, you heard someone allude to this during the movie, they would hold up their hands and rotate it. So you're walking down the street and you just see African Americans doing this. As, and it was, it was almost surreal. And the, when you asked the policemen, they said, that was our job. We had to stop this person. And um, so it was, it was quite remarkable. Um, and that concludes my introductory remarks. Goodbye. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, um, speaking of this small community nature, I don't know if this makes much difference, but was this troop C the Oneonta police or the state troopers? State troopers, I believe. Mm -hmm. oh. the, that is exactly right. The state troopers came in um, and said to the Oneonta police, you have to take our lead here. And the other part that, do you mind if I do this? This is no. the CIA, because the, for those of you who read Clancy novels, which I consider high literature, <laughs> um, in, the, in the midst of this, and there was a reference to it as well, we, we, I couldn't understand how they could make up so many facts. First, it was a burglary, and then when it got into the New York Times, it was an attempted rape, then the dog makes a left. And we have people going through this stuff, and it, it just doesn't match or making it up. And then someone, said, it, someone said, it was sort of a lead, Scott, don't you know about the investigation into the troop? Doesn't take much digging. What happened was this fellow Chandler on, you saw, you know, the um, Hama Hama guy yeah. who you saw up there? He was the lead investigator. Apparently, a year before, one of his subordinates applied for a job at the Central Intelligence Agency in Washington as a field operative. And he was doing very well. He was gonna go be a spook. I think that's what they call them. You know, they go out and be, and he goes field operative. He's gonna go out and do this. And he stands there. And so he's standing for a polygraph. He passes every test. And the section chief of the, 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 the CIA section asks him a question while he's hooked up to the polygraph. We don't want, he said, section chief, we don't want any choir boys or altar boys here are you gonna be a choir boy or altar boy? And this guy said, this moron said, with due respect, and I wouldn't say that often, but he said, you have nothing to worry about. I'm neither a choir boy nor altar boy. I know what the CIA expects from its spies. I belong to a state police troop where we make up evidence. We fabricate evidence when we figure out someone's guilty. So the, poly, the, poly, so the section chief said, how precisely do you do that? <laughs> so he said, if his fingerprints are here, we, we put them on tape and we move them to the glass at the crime scene. And we, we move around, so don't you worry, hire me. They were shocked. This is the CIA. So they reported to the FBI. The FBI reported. So it was this guy. He was re retired. Two other guys, two or three other guys. Some, uh, three guys, I think, maybe went to jail. But so when you hear these guys talking about well, the dog went left, well, burglary rape, I made it up, I never read the statement. It was just a bad police troop, it was a state police troop, and they said they are going to get the, these guys. And, and I, I, I'll say one more thing about my wife, uh, the, but, <laughs> but, but during, during the course of this, she said something, and I'd be interested in your reaction, because she said, Scott, were, were they just, with the police basically saying to the African-American community, behave, we can do this anytime we want, we're, 
you know, just essentially intimidating you. And I, I said, you don't know anything about what I would stop that. To. But I'm getting the feeling she's right. I mean, what was She's your, correct. Is she correct? She's correct. Could you keep your voice down, please? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to yelling and teach. Um, no, uh, my experience was, was the lie. Uh, the fact that I came from the, the Hunt Union and I was told there was a rape. And just like one of my brothers on the, on the film, um, you know, not being the most handsome or the ugliest, I, it's just not in my mind to do anything like that. And I was told there was a rape on campus and uh, there was a bloody towel found. And the bloody towel, you know, I don't know anything about DNA. CSI Miami wasn't created yet. So I'm, I'm there and she tells me that the, the DNA was a black man's DNA. And I'm like, wait a second. So you're going to search every black guy on campus. And if it was a white guy, would you search all 8,000 of us? And it's just unbelievable. She said, yeah, no, we wouldn't search all, eight, uh, all 8,000 white guys, but it's okay to do the, you know, 100, 200 black guys. And I'm thinking... It's not, it's Jim Crow. You can't do that. And, and we got into an argument and I used some of the terminology that Bo's fond of. And, um, <laughs> you know, we went back and forth. So my, my, my initial experience was there was a towel found right outside of my dorm. And you're looking at me and I'm just coming from the hunt union eating greasy fries and a nasty hamburger. You know, what's wrong with you? So yeah, your wife is, as they always are, your wife is right. <laughs> <laughs> I am... Um... Well, I guess one other comment for those of you who are say, well, just so much time and effort was invested into. I mean, why the hell didn't you show your hands? I mean, what? But the Heel Watson eighth grade. That's why I literally have a pencil scratch from eighth grade Bahia Watson arguing over, you know, something nonsense. You know, hey, that's my pencil. No, it's mine. You know, so you're afraid because, like some of those guys said, I grew up in the inner city. Right. You know, and. I remember going to basketball practice, being pulled over by a police officer, and I'm going to CYO basketball practice, so it's, it's the best basketball practice. It's in a church, you know? <laughs> Father coach is not gonna let me do anything wrong. And I remember the police officer pulling me over, stopping me and searching me, uh, because I lived in an area that sold drugs, and I'm gonna play basketball, I have nothing to do with drugs. And I felt like it's me and him, it's dark, he's got a gun, I've got a basketball. I'd only win in a cartoon. It's real life. So we're used to this. This is something that I grew up with. So I understand why people were afraid because this is our life ever since we could remember. I now have a six-year-old son who last summer was his first encounter with the police, twice. You know, we're, we're going home and uh, you know, I have two cars. I have a beat up Honda that I like to drive because it's beat up um, and reminds me of older days. And we're in the car, the police pulls us over because we look like we don't belong in the neighborhood. I, my son is a mutant. He's about, damn it, he's always my height, you know? So he's quite tall. And the police officer could not find anything to uh, give me a ticket for. So he came out, then his other police officer came out, uh, showed him that I was a former military officer. So could still couldn't find anything. Then he sees my son who's got this thing for cushions. So my son's sitting on a cushion. He's like, well, I'm going to give you a ticket for your son using a, car, a cushion as a car seat. I'm like, dude, he's taller than me. What are you talking about? But I still had to pay for the ticket. You know, it was better to pay for the ticket than to argue. The next time, a couple weeks later, we're at the park playing tennis. It gets dark. It's cold. My son's in the car. We're discussing, does he want a Happy Meal or does he want the Wendy's Kids Meal? He decides on the Wendy's Kids Meal, but a light comes behind us, shines it right in our faces. I go out of the car thinking it's someone playing a prank. It turns out to be a police officer. What are you doing here at the park? Well, I'm with my son. Well, there are rumors that people are doing drugs. I'm playing tennis with my son. You know, unless he's doing PEDs, he's not doing anything. So one thing led to another. We get into a confrontation. I tell him, look, at this point, I've had it with you guys. Either shoot me or let me go have a happy meal with my son. This has been going on way too long. So my son says to me again, what did we do, daddy? So I can't explain that to you. He's six. So if he were in my situation 20 years later, he might have the same thing. You know what? I'm not going to show my hands or I'll show because I'm afraid that you might shoot me. You know, we go home. I tell my wife all she can do is, you know, try to hold him and say it's going to be all right. And that's it. So I grew up like that. Unfortunately, my son has experiences in that. And he doesn't know if police are good guys or bad guys. And that's sad because I want him to think police are good guys. But in his mind, 
He's a little bit ambiguous, and that's just one thing he crossed off his career list. So he's going to stick to being a Power Ranger or a scientist. Uh. <laughs> I, I, I almost think um, what, what I find particularly moving is what, what, we're just going to talk, you guys. We're just going to talk, if you don't mind. It's been a while. It's been many years, too many years. Um, <laughs> Before one of the oral arguments, um, and, and Kirk may, may not remember this, um, and, and Tron wasn't here yet, but, but um, I said to, we were gathered, it was one of the important arguments for the Court of Appeals, and, and so the faculty and the students had gathered to hear this argument, and I said, look, I'm having a problem. Um, I'm a middle-aged Jewish guy. I'm old, older now, but, but middle-aged Jewish guy. I can tell you what the law is. I can really strain to empathize, but I'm going to stand in front of that panel of judges, and I'm not going to feel it. Uh, they, they won't because I don't understand it. And I guess I never asked you what it's like. What's so we spent about an hour, and I think at that point they wished they had um, uh, they had hired a different lawyer. But we went around the room, and and it was remarkable. I said, "What's it like?" And they said, "Scott." We're walking down the road at dusk. I'm going to be a poet or a scientist or a teacher, and there's a white woman. She crosses the street. Scott, I go into a convenience store. You know how when you go into a convenience store, there's a, a, a woman behind the counter, and she drops change, but her, her fingers graze your palm so the change doesn't drop out? Watch what happens with black people. They, it's an inch above. They, there's, there's a desire not, not to make contact. Scott. When the elevator opens and we're in it, you'll notice that. And one professor, Ralph Watkins, said to me, he said, let me tell you what my twin son said. He said, I said to them, um, kids, you can be anything in America. And one of them said, dad, that may or may not be true, but it's hard to believe given the fact that when we walk down the street, when I walk down the street at dusk, white people cross over the road. So I guess it's hard to imagine being anything in America where most of the people are afraid of you. And, and, and you hear stories like that, and then you add to it the indignation of a stop, just to rotate your hands, being on a list. But at some point, I think you probably say, this isn't really my country. These aren't people who are my countrymen and countrywomen. I mean, it's a, there's, there's a dis, why do I frighten them? Um, and that's a question I've, I've, I've not been, I've not been able to answer. What, why are you frightening? I mean, what is it? I run, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I don't, I don't think we look at it, or I would look at it as two different countries. I think you understand that you live in a duplicitous society where you exist in one realm, and you need to exist in the other realm so that you could survive, you could feed your family, you can gain great experiences, uh, you could travel. Um, but when you go home, it's different. You know, you feel a certain love, a certain respect. Um, the love that I got at home may not have been the love that I got on the street. Walking around my neighborhood being predominantly black and Spanish was, even though it was a bad neighborhood, I felt safer in that neighborhood because I knew if I walk down this street, they got that one guy, the lazy eye guy, he might shoot me or rob me. At least I know who my enemy is. But when I'm in Oneonta, you know, when I first got there, I had dreads in my hair. I'd walk through the local store and, and I would be watched. I'm not trying to steal anything, but it was a shortcut. So I'm walking through the store. Um, when I'm driving, you know, now I still feel that way. Like, man, if there's a siren that goes on, I think it's me. Even though I'm, speed limit says 55 and I'm going 45 but I still think it's me. So you exist in a world that loves you and, and treats you well and respects you, and you go into another world that doesn't you know, really accept you as who you are. I have a name, Kirk Allen. I've been on job interviews where Kirk Allen's been called and people look around the room until I stand up. When they mention you have two bachelors and a master's and you're working on a, another one, I stand up and people look at me like, wait a second, I, you're not Kirk Allen. Then, then who am I? Because when I pay taxes, I pay for Kirk Allen. So it has to be Kirk Allen. So you live in this world and you're forever going to live in this world. You know, my best friend who's in the back or somewhere around here, keeps moving, he's white. 
And for some people, they can't understand that. Sean and I instantly clicked when I saw him, and he's white. It had nothing to do with him being white, but I feel like because we shared the experience of Oneonta, he's part of that family. He will forever be part of my family. And, and it's hard for the world to understand that, but that's how we live. We live in a world that says, it's okay to do certain things, but don't do too much. It's okay to be confident, but don't be too confident. You know, we accept you to a certain point, but then we want you to slow down a little. Huh. Yeah. And one of the things that really triggered me um, when I was interviewing people that uh, live in the city now, and you know, I asked them, do you tell your children or your nieces or your nephews? And a lot of them told me that they did, but they got a response they never expected, which was their, their nieces, their nephews, their children would kind of just shrug their shoulders and be like, what's the big deal? That's stop and frisk. That's something that goes on with me and my friends every day. Um, and that really took me for a shocker. But it's kind of the question I was going to ask you, Sean, as you're starting to show this documentary at film festivals and other places. I'm wondering what the reaction is in light of the fact that racial profiling has become so acceptable in, in law enforcement. Um, you know, when I started this in 2007, that was kind of a question I was asking was, do you think this could happen again? And, um, you know, it was a mixture. A lot of people don't think it could happen again in Oneonta. Uh, they've learned their lesson, but it could happen elsewhere. Um, as I said, you know, it, it's, it's in this past week, it's been to Kansas, to Texas, uh, to Philadelphia, this movie. And wherever it goes, people are saying that this is something that they can relate to in that situation. Um, I, again, it goes back to Oneana. I, I, I think Oneana is in a bit safer of a place because of this film being around, um, now that they're having discussions on it. Uh, fortunately, the police, uh, the mayor and the police chief in Oneana have both watched the film now, and uh, they're working towards having diversity summits on it. Um, you know, when I started this, I did not expect the police chief or the mayor to even warrant the time to watch the film. So I think they're in a good space right now. Um, I just think it's a discussion that needs to be had elsewhere. Hi, my questions, well, their questions um, are for Kirk. Um, just a few things. Um, I was wondering, you know, you said you grew up in the inner city. Um, where did you grow up at? I grew up in Poughkeepsie. Okay, and then where do you live now? I still live near Poughkeepsie. Okay, and the reason I ask is because um, one of the plaintiffs, Holton Gordon, um, was is a friend of well was a friend of mine. Um, I've since moved up to Albany from the Bronx, and um, um, is it safe to say that you're um, American? You're a Black American? No, it's not. I'm Canadian okay. by birth, and I grew up in Jamaica until I was about six, and I went back and forth to Canada, and then I figured, hey, America, I'll try it out. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Just because, you know, even within that group of individuals who were on that college campus or state university campus, there's diversity. You have some people who are Canadian. Hopeton was from Jamaica originally. I'm quite sure there were black Americans um, who were on that campus. And, you know, even amongst that group, there was diversity. And in terms of life experiences, you know, like for instance, me being a black American, you know, I went to Siena College between 1990 and 1994. I was born and raised in the South Bronx, so I had a very similar experience in that. I went to a school that was completely different than where I grew up. You know, I went from being the majority in the South Bronx, pretty much in my high school, to being the minority in, you know, a predominantly white school. Um, but I know that my experience is my experience as an African American in a situation like that in, in terms of black and white relationships is totally different than someone who grew up in Jamaica because, you know, you know, their ancestors weren't living under, you know, their grandparents didn't experience Jim Crow, even my parents, you know, their parents didn't experience Jim Crow in the American culture, you know, they had a different um, experience. So I was just curious if you guys ever talked about how your experiences were different from each other. Uh, we never really had those conversations, but I can tell you that I went from, say, I was in school in Jamaica at a very young age, and it was a one-room schoolroom that's probably half the size of this dirt floor. I wrote with Slate. For those of you who don't know Slate, it's basically a blackboard in your hand. 
I was the majority. Everyone looked like me. I went to Canada. It was me and Michelle. That's it. <laughs> it was me and Michelle. But no one ever made me feel like it was me and Michelle. I didn't experience negativity with racism until I came to America. That was the first time someone called me the N-word, and I didn't know they were talking to me. Like, and what? What's that? Is something we eating? Because I had no idea. Um, and then Poughkeepsie High School, and the city of Poughkeepsie's always been ranked, unfortunately, top 50 in a state in violence. So, and I was part of a predominantly black school. So I know what it's like to be in all of the different situations. And I, I think I adapted pretty well. And maybe the experience that I had there, and the fact that when I was in 11th grade, I was on my own. So for me to say, the blacklist is gonna make me run, where am I gonna to run to, right? So I'm gonna stay and I'm only gonna go forward. I'm not gonna go back, I'm just gonna keep going forward. I was fortunate enough that my tennis coach uh, became my guardian and watched over me and both scared the hell out of me, right? I'm gonna be honest, he looked at me nice and I'm gonna drag your ass to school. I'm like, okay, that, that works for me. And Bo's a big dude and he was younger then, all right? So I took him to heart. So my experience was varied, but it was, it was one that was optimistic and, and I couldn't look back. Like, so where was I gonna go? And if I quit now, maybe they do win. And, and I don't like to lose. Yeah, well, Chris, let me, just, just for a moment, you know, the, the other perspective, I mean, there, there's the, the African-American perspective, um, and then there's the, the, the white perspective, sort of the, the, what I learned in the depositions, the white uh, uh, policeman perspective. A policeman pulls over your car and looks inside, and if it's a white kid, he sees his son or his daughter or his niece or his nephew. There's a, a, almost a visceral connection. This is someone, a reasonably good person, who was misguided and pressing on the gas too much or something. But, but there's that connection. When they look in the car and they don't see someone who they can relate to, it becomes different, and this, this, so your experience so affected me that my, my, our youngest is, is from Chile, and he looks like he's from Chile, and so now he gets his driver's license, and I said to him, I had the, the conversation I didn't want to have, but it was in the midst of this case, and I said, son, you're gonna get a speeding ticket someday. That is not a license to speed, but you, <laughs> you, you will get a speeding ticket, and a police officer will pull you over and he will look at you through the window, and he will not see his son or his nephew. He'll see someone who is different, and so different things are a little scary, and you are to put both hands on the steering wheel. I used to be a law enforcement of sorts. Put both hands on the steering wheel and say, officer, for whatever I did, I'm sorry, and he'll say, may I see your, your, your registration? And you are to say, officer, my registration is in my glove compartment. Um, may I open my glove compartment and, and reach for my registration, or officer, would you prefer to do it? Do not move quickly, take your time and give the officer. That's a conversation I never had with our biological daughter. Never, ever had, because they would see her and say, hey, it looks like my daughter, what am I worried about? So it is a, it's a very, very funny thing. That, that's one of the great challenges I've, 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 I've had in trying to understand this. How do you train thousands of police officers in understanding that we are a mosaic of a country? Not everyone looks like his family, and how do you? And I don't know if there's there's such a thing. But go ahead. I'm sorry. I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> um, I have two distinctly different questions. One for Sean. Um, hi, Sean. Uh, what documentaries did you look to for inspiration while you made this film? And Kirk, my question for you is, do you share this experience with people now? And if so, like when you tell them what happened on such a stage with like a dragnet of sense, what's people's reaction when you share that with them now in 2013, 2014? I'll wait for Sean to answer. <laughs> yeah, um, quickly, uh, my two biggest influences with this uh, were uh, Thin Blue Line, which was a police investigation movie by Errol Morris. Um, the, this, the pacing he did and basically taking a step back and um, 
letting the people be interviewed and, and not put their voice into it. Uh, I found that very important. The first cut of this film actually had my voice. Uh, I had my voice the whole time narrating the whole film. And um, it was another film which was played here uh, last year actually called uh, Let the Fire Burn. Uh, that one was done entirely with archival footage and really um, treated the audience to be smart, uh, to make their own decisions. You didn't need my voice to tell you what to think. Um, the film itself and the people being interviewed could do that for it. So those two, and then there was another one uh, called My Brother's Keeper, which is a um, highly recommend. Uh, it took place in upstate New York too, and actually um, a couple of the officers from Troop C that are interviewed in it are also in that one, so <laughs> quite interesting. <laughs> um, I really never went around talking about it so much as if it came up in conversation or through the process of teaching. Um, I, I don't teach social studies, but I would always go to a social studies teacher and I'd say, hey, um, there's something that happened when I went to college. And I'd bring in this folder of all the material that I saved and I would pass it on to them. And occasionally they'd have me come into their class and speak about it. Uh, what I would try to get across is that, you know, civil rights isn't something that happened 100 years ago. And because you didn't read it in a book or you didn't know that it existed, it doesn't mean that the struggle doesn't continue. It goes on for, for many different people, you know. Um, it could be a, a black issue, it could be a Jewish issue, it could be a gay issue, but civil rights are still uh, something that we have to fight for every day. And it might be something you do locally or small or, you know, even on a grand scale, but it's something that continues. So I try not to be bitter and I hope that they see that I'm not bitter and I try to encourage them not to be bitter, but you have to stand up for what you believe in is right when that time occurs. You know, sometimes you're going to be calm, and other times you're going to scream. But stand up for what you think is right. Um, hopefully this will be shown at my school. Uh, some of the people that have previewed the movie, they seem to like the message behind it. Um, and, and that's really it. Just be, I don't know, it's, it's hard, because it it's hard for me to, to really, you know, go back in that time. It was, it's hard again sitting there watching it. The first time I saw I cried like a baby. Uh, thank God Sean's got good hands and he could hold me tight because I was crying, <laughs> you know. Um, it's just hard because it, it's part of your life. You know, you grow up, you're really, if you think about everybody in the world, you're just this one little speck, right? If we're all like a beach and we're all sand on the beach, I'm just this one little grain of sand. But now my life is embedded in this, in this thing that happened, this event that shook a college and changed lives and people left and people stayed and you know Bo lost his hair I mean <laughs> it's 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 I don't know I can't it's one of those things where I would love to be able to put it in words and be able to tell everyone how it makes me feel and how I react but I can't you know it's it's hard you know and, and depending on who you are and the day you catch me I, I don't know I might give you a different opinion, but I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to stay consistent and say be positive and just stand up, that's it. And an initial reaction uh, from a lot of the students was they wanted to leave the school. Uh, a few of them did immediately as the years went on, a few others uh, didn't graduate or transferred. Um, but really the response from Bo, from Cheryl, and from a lot of the parents, I think it happened to you too, Kirk, was um, you're letting them win if you leave the college. Uh, the best way to prove to them that they did not put you down is to continue to get your college education. That's what you came here for. And um, I think that was very admirable of the students to stay. Yeah, I went back for a second degree from there. So it's not like, you know, I got one bachelor's, if one is good, two's better. So I went back, you know. I, you don't go back to a place to get another degree, to take 20 credits every semester to finish it up real quick, still go to bars, um, and, 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 and say, I'm a part of this family. You don't, you don't, you have other choices. There's so many other colleges. Why would you do that if there was venom in your heart? So. I don't know, maybe looking back and I could say, I don't know if I was healed, but I was willing to give Oneonta the benefit of the doubt. Because Oneonta gave me the benefit of the doubt. You gotta understand that. Like, this, and I've said that to Sean, like, despite all of the things that went on, you still took a chance on me. You still gave me a shot that, I don't know, that maybe another school wouldn't have. I still have, I still have friends from there. I still walk on campus and people see me and like, hey, I remember you, you didn't turn in your paper. It's 20 years ago, doc, what do you want? 
So if you're willing to give me a chance, you still know who I am. You can remember key points. I played basketball with my professors, you know, but I had a, I had a negative stretch. And, and do I let that negative stress dominate my life? It's, it's like American history. We've had slavery, we've had internment camps, we've had all this stuff. But if we only focus on that one negative part in our history, then what kind of nation are we? We're not a nation, we're just like separate people living together, pretending to be under the same flag and saying the pledge. It doesn't work. So despite that, I went back. So, I'm, I'm, and I would send my son there. I'd send all my kids there because there's not much to do other than be on campus. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's a good spot for that. I will say when we went and filmed on the campus, there really was a professor that yelled across the way at Kirk and yes. said, go home, Kirk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Still remember. I, I we, love the way, I don't have mic, but I have a lot now. Um, I love the way you just kept juxtaposing um, the bucolic setting with the story. I thought that was really effective. Thank you. Um, I, uh, when I was in college, I think the psychologist was Kenneth Clark, I'm not positive. Um, he did a very famous study interviewing little, little kids, four-year-olds, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, black doll, white doll, or shown them, which doll is better? And the answers broke my heart. Every single kid pointed the white doll is better, the white doll is smarter, the white doll is prettier, you name it. I heard recently, I read recently, there was some other study. This is 30 years later, and the same, same answers occurred. Um, I was a big sister many, many years ago, and I'm still in contact with the kid. She's now, the kid is now, 50. But she's got, she's got a son, and she got, the son was in her car. Uh, she's turned out beautifully, but her son was in her car, and they got out in front of her apartment building, and there had been some crime committed, and the, some officer with the, the stop and frisk, he wanted to go into the apartment, into they, their apartment building because he was black. I guess my question is, the stories like this, do your son's friends that are black suffer, do many of them suffer from this, this horrible self-esteem issues from an early age that are obviously still prevalent? Um, I don't think we've improved very much at all, although many blacks have succeeded. But other than that, there's so much prejudice. <laughs> Unconscious the prejudice. I can't say about everyone else's son, but my son's a little cocky. All right, <laughs> he is. We pl we'll play a game and he'll say, "Daddy, I'm gonna beat you." And then when he loses, like, "Daddy, I'm gonna beat you." So it's it's not not my son, but I can say for other, you know, I can't speak for other people, but I'm sure it happens. But we also live in a world where the way I speak makes people think, "Hmm, you're not really black, are you?" Now that this thing happened, I bet you feel like you're black, don't you? So we, that, those are conversations that had taken place. So understand that, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. The white doll, the black doll, the white doll, some people think it's better. Other kids will think, you know what, I'm okay with being black. That's what I am, I like it. But we also live in a world where, forget about the color, just the vocabulary, your manner of speaking. My son does get criticized at times for the way he speaks because he speaks like daddy. And daddy speaks like a white man, according to some of our friends, and dare I say, some of our relatives. So yeah, the judgment on him, it's not the color that he plays with. It's the fact that my son could put a sentence together. It's the fact that he'll say, daddy, I'm out of here. You know, his cousin might not say that, but he'll say that to me. He'll put things together, I'm like, really? You're really saying that to me? Yes, Father, I'm not approving of your behavior. I'm going to my room. I'm like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? <laughs> so, yeah, it still exists, but it exists in a different way. And as a teacher, I see it where kids that are African American who do speak, they'll say speak well, I just say speak normal, because in my house, that's how you spoke. 
All right. Um, so they speak like I was raised to speak. They are looked at differently. They're looked at as selling out. They're looked at as being, you know, black on the outside and white on the inside. And I think you all know what that is because you're probably in your closet or your kitchen cabinet. It's an Oreo. All right. So, yeah, it still exists. Yes. We all noted that the administrators declined to be interviewed for your film. Uh, is there any on the record statements from them as to what in hell they were thinking? Um, the only things are the archival footage that's in the film. Uh, that's all I could pull, uh, which was mainly the police officers. But um, Hartmark has never given any statements about it. I would have absolutely loved to have interviewed him because it goes back to um, really the thought of he didn't do this out of, of racist intent. He did it out of complete ignorance and complete obliviousness to what he was doing. Uh, you have to put into context what his position was an administrator, which was finance and administration. Uh, that's a position where the state calls you asking for information, certain information about students, and his job is to immediately give it to them. He wasn't ever put into a situation of police going to and asking for that information. Um, you know, you also have to put into context uh, who, where this woman was staying, the woman who was attacked. She was staying at, um, what was it? It was a trustee. trustee. It was a trustee for the state college. Uh, she was staying at their house. So there was an urgency by the police and by the administrators at the college to solve this crime as quickly as possible. And that's where, um, you know, Hartmark's immediate pressure was there. Uh, Donovan, you know, I, he was the president while I was there. Uh, he's done amazing, amazing things. He had an amazing career there. Uh, you know, he was also, this was only his second or third year as president there. So he was completely new and he got thrown into this. Um, I, think it, I think their silence uh, speaks just as much as their words could in the end, though. When they, they were, Hart, <laughs> Hartmark was, I, I spoke with, with both, um, I think off the record. And uh, this falls into my the least favorite Villains without uh, victims without villains. I mean, Hartmark would say that he th there was something called the Buckley Amendment, and, and your kids are, are subject to the Buckley Amendment. When you go to school, the schools ask a, a lot of information, demographic information, and the like, and uh, but they're not permitted to give it out because the great fear is that people will come up with lists. I mean, that was the underlying, they have to ask for that information because the federal government wants to make certain that you have a diverse population and that you're not doing anything stupid, but you may not give it out to those who would develop a list. Hartmark uh, knew that. What happened was the police came, the one exception to the Buck Buckley Amendment is emergency circumstance and exigency, the world. And Hartmark, I think, I think his memory serves, probably say he was a fairly benign guy. He said, I, I can't give you, I, he wanted him to run the computer list. He said, I can't, the Buckley Amendment, and the police officer, Chandler, said, let me just tell you, it was a rape, and that was the first time it was elevated to a rape or an attempted rape of an elderly person, and there's nothing scares black, white men more than you know a black man trying to rape a white woman. I, that goes back eons. And, and he made a beeline for the school, and he's going to rape more people at the school, and it's on you. Well, I, I, I'd, I'd like to pretend that I would take the high road, and I'd say, Buckley Amendment. <laughs> I don't think so. I'd say, here's the list. And then the, the only scary part of the list, and let me, let me add this, and, and you know, many things were uncovered during the course of litigation, which um, causes you to, to sort of a clench your, your jaw. Um, he, he printed out all the blacks, men and women on the list, came out of the computer, and he gave them the computer sheet. I must have said, I want that back. I mean, that was the first thing I said. I don't want that list around. I don't know where it's going to go. He said, take it back. He gives it back. And three years later, during the course of the litigation, I find out before he gave it to me, he downloaded all the names into the state police computer. So there's a list of all black people in Oneonta in the state police computer. And I said, what world, how do you stop it? You know, the next time there's an offense. But going back to Hartmark, um, I, I don't know what I would have done in, in that circumstance when you have people who fabricate, in, cops who fabricate information, uh, he just got scared and he turned it over. Um, 
and these things happen. You know, what am I going to, what are you going to do? And there's really a pattern that can continue on college campuses with institutional racism. Uh, you have to realize a college town and specifically just the college itself has a new population every four years. Uh, the memory of what happened can be wiped away within four years. And now you're talking about numerous cycles of that that have gone on. Um, you know, it, it mentioned in the film, four years after these students graduated, or rather, after all these students graduated, they put Hartmark back in the same position. Um, you know, that just showed like, okay, the people are gone that remember it, now we could go back to the way things were. Um, and it should also be pointed out because, uh, you know, you start to see all these connections of how one thing can have such an effect on other things. Um, this isn't the first documentary uh, that was uh, spotlight, put a spotlight on SUNY Oneonta. Uh, there was another one that was, oddly enough, directed by um, the guy who made The Hangover. Um, but it was his, his first uh, film was a documentary about uh, hazing, uh, Greek life hazing. Oh, really? And uh, it, they spent months in, in Oneonta in 1997 and 1998 uh, filming the, the hazing that was going on, on uh, off campus, unrecognized fraternities. Um, now, I was in Greek life at college, and what they had always told us was these groups got kicked off campus because they were partying too much. What I would end up finding after contacting people were a lot of fraternities walked off campus uh, in, in, to, to stand up for the rights of some of their members that were black, and also in just solidarity of, of the students during the Brothers of the Blacklist. So what you have here is these student groups walking off campus. Uh, by four years later, the GPA had dropped up below 2.5. They're letting in all of these kids that are coming to college basically to party. And this led to this uh, whole uh, atmosphere of hazing on the campus that still exists to this day. And it was just really interesting to see how this one thing could affect something that you wouldn't even think would have any connection. I, I just, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say something positive. Um, <laughs> because I, I don't want to have too many glum faces. Um, the, in the, the 20 some odd years since um, the incident, uh, it took a while, but the state, New York State Police, more recently the New York City Police Department and most localities have adopted, um, it, because it's a model, I, I, I've seen it, 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 a pretty reasonable race profiling uh, policy or, or anti-race profiling policy. I mean, on its face, uh, it, it may, gives you some level of comfort. The question is, and if it took 20 years for them to adopt it, it's the human condition. It'll probably take another 20 years before, you know, someone sees Kirk and says, yeah, you remind me of my son or <laughs> something. I mean, it, it will take a long time. But we are headed in, in the right direction. Um, what, what I think is, is critically important is what Sean has done because, um, we tend to come up with policies and then say, well, we've, we've certainly cured this problem. What's the next problem we need a policy about? And implementation is critically important. And the essence of implementation is having someone who's vigilant and to say, this can't happen again. We are watching to make certain not to be punitive, but to make certain you're good to your word. And so why I, that's why I, I think it is a, a critically important film. And hopefully it will be shown in high schools and youngsters can appreciate the importance of it. So. Uh, microphone. It's uh, over here. Hi. Sean, I'd like to thank you for making the film. Thank you. In the early 90s, I moved up north for school and um, Sage College. And a couple of the students that were involved in there came down to, you know, and we were all angry about it, he was upset. And um, for years, I mean, they never went back to school, of course. Mm. Sad story. There was two brothers, they were there, and um, it was a sad ending. And for years, I haven't heard about it again. You know, I was swept under the carpet, never, no one knew what's wrong. What was the end result? We heard about the result with few people, you know, it was taken care of, but then we don't know what was the relation with the uh, police and the school and the campus. Don't know if there's any evidence with their uh, procedures or what's that new policy for 
new students for the relationship between the police department and the school. So I think this film probably will bring out more talk and light on, on this. Thank you. But thank you, that's a good, good film. No, I appreciate it uh, yeah. a lot. And um, you know, I, I, as I said before, I, I think Oneana is in a good place, but at the same time, there's many things to be worried about in the town. Um, the whole 20th anniversary event um, kind of gave me mixed feelings and mixed emotions about the whole thing. I felt very uncomfortable being there personally and being a part of the dialogue going on knowing that people like Kirk weren't even... I didn't in, even know. Weren't, I, there's, knowing that out of the 125 students, there's easily over 100 of them that have no idea that there was an anniversary uh, in honor of them. Um, you know, and, and things started coming out, you know, as I started thinking about it more in the weeks afterwards. Um, you know, I, Cornell West, as you saw, was the guest speaker there. The school brought Cornell West in 1993 in response to this happening. It, it's just like they just 20 years later, they're just repeating the same pattern of what they did. Um, you know, um, the, pre the president, who's been amazing and really supportive of the film, but at the same time, her speech during the, during the Blacklist um, anniversary is almost word to word the, po the apology that Hartmark gave to the students. There was no, not like I expect her to actually apologize, like she did anything wrong, but it was all these, we regret that we did this. And you know, the thing that really rubs me the wrong way is the plaque that's at the campus. It says Beyond the List on it, which was the name of the 20th anniversary event. It's not the blacklist. It's not in remembrance of what happened 20 years ago. It's in remembrance of this great thing that we as a community came together about just a couple of years ago. And the other thing that's just a funny side story is that event, I was just watching everyone pour water into this tree. I'm like, they're gonna drown this tree right yeah. now. And that tree has not grown a leaf since it's been planted. <laughs> since I generally argue with Scott, uh, <laughs> let me go back to his comments about the progress that he said has been made. Uh, in many ways, what happened in Oneonta seems to me a, fo a form, a different form of stop and frisk. And that is they were stopping people for the purpose of investigating a crime, trying to find who did the crime. And of course, we spent the last 12 years in New York City with a major stop and frisk program justified on exactly the same grounds uh, by both the mayor and uh, the police commissioner. Uh, and in addition, we learned and headline the first page of the New York Times today that there was uh, a part of the police department uh, which fundamentally targeted Muslims. So I just wonder, did, have we really made progress in the last 20 years? Well, you know, I, the, the answer is, I mean, that's a sort of a rhetorical question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I know that uh, the current uh, mayor and, and com police commissioner have acceded to a, a monitor in New York City to, uh, to, to, to try to monitor the use of stop and frisk because as a concept, it has some application. I mean, it, it's not something you want abandons. It's, but but um, I, I, I don't know. I, there's so many things. Um, it, it's, again, that we come out with policies. I don't know if these policies ultimately will make a, a, a bit of difference. But yes, do I think there's progress? Um, I think so. I think in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, race profiling became a, a, a matter of national security policy. It was okay to race pro. In fact, we were encouraged to profile because remember, we are all supposed to be vigilant to citizens. Um, that set us back many, many years in the struggle. I think we've made dramatic progress since then. We've recognized that that's no longer, that was no longer a, a good strategy, a, a national security strategy. But uh, to, to answer your question, Richard, I, I can't. Um, though I can talk around it forever but I, I can't answer it. <laughs> but Scott, could, could this, could the way the, the blacklist case ended, the, the end result from the last time you were in the courts, could that be used as a precedent to defend stop and frisk? I, um, I think not. I, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm um, the, the case that was dismissed was dismissed because they thought that each person who was stopped, it was sui generis. It's a, uh, it was individual to that person, and so you couldn't bring a big class action on behalf because every person had a, a, a different role. Um, 
I don't think that it, it means much. I will tell you a story, though. The, the, just, just after we won the case in the Court of Appeals, and, and, and the hour's growing late, so this is my last story, certainly. Uh, the, when, when we won a case in the Court of Appeals, and, and for the first time you could bring a, 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 a lawsuit against the state of New York for violating your constitutional rights. That could be eliminating religion, uh, stop and frisk, almost anything. Anything that, that your, the Constitution safeguards, if they, if, they, if, they, if they extinguish that right, you can bring a lawsuit. So I was pretty full of myself because that was a serious precedent. And so the judges invited me to their annual conference. And I said, they are going to celebrate this victory. I, was, I, I knew that was going to happen. And so I go to the Catskills, where they seem to have their conferences, and I walked in, and I, they, they were in a horseshoe around me. And they said, well, Scott, maybe we can begin by asking you, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> so I thought I, I really be, would be lorded for this. And I said, well, what do you mean? And to, to shortcut this process, they said, Scott, when an individual is improperly incarcerated in New York State. That is to say they're found guilty, they're incarcerated for 15 years, and then they're exonerated because we find that they didn't do the crime, the district attorney or the cops lied. We give that individual $32 a day for his wrongful incarceration. We're just wondering as a group, what do you think it's worth for a police officer to wrongfully ask someone to show their hands. And I realized they were making fun of me because they were basically saying, you didn't win anything. You didn't win anything. So I, I don't know if there'll ever be, 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 be real progress. But again, let me go back to my last point, which is you need someone, we need cops who can watch civil liberties being applied, and, and that's the media. That, that, that's, that's the media. I have one more thing to say, and then I'm done. And then I'm done, because it is like, sure. um, OK, Don't you can me. laugh, but I'm a lawyer. Typically, I'm paid by the minute, but this time I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 14 years, I, I counted up uh, this morning something I'd, I'd never done before, and I counted the number of people at my law firm who had since left, and were some, a few stayed, but since left, who, who uh, worked on this matter. And, and it was not me. I did the least of it, but there were some 48 people at the firm who over 14 years uh, played roles. And, and of those, I, I just want to acknowledge, and, and not everyone's here today, but, but uh, Paul Rapp, Scott Bassinson, uh, Joe Stinson, uh, Melissa Hoops, uh, uh, Liz Haight, uh, who just, uh, you know, to the extent that the defense was waged properly uh, and thoughtfully, they did it. Uh, and so you have my deepest gratitude. Um, and that's <laughs> That concludes my comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's just do like two more questions uh, and wrap it up. And, yeah. hey, I was wondering if the city of Oneonta, if the residents of Oneonta were more sympathetic to the police when this happened or to the brothers. And then as the events unfolded over the next couple of weeks or months, did their sympathies change? Were they sympathetic to the students? And, well, just wondered, you know. And then also, the Central Park jogger incident had just occurred a few years earlier, so I was wondering if anyone had ever, you know, if any of the residents had the film, whatever noun you want, to cite to that as a justification for the police action. Um, I'm going to say no and no. Uh, Oneonta is so small that I don't think they think beyond Oneonta. And they treated us differently before the incident. And they looked at us even more different after the incident. So if it did change, it, it was like the market when it started to dip uh, seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, you know, I, 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 we walk downtown and like people look at you. We, you go into a, a store and you're being followed. You go to a restaurant, people are looking at you. There was one night after, much more after the incident, but I was out with my roommate, who's here now. We went into a, a bar, and we, we were, it, it's like one of those scenes from Deliverance, and he's here, he could back me up. They said, there are only two things in Oneonta, steers and queers, and we don't see any steers. So we left the bar, and they followed us, and then we left and just decided to go home, because I could, I could run, I wasn't sure about him. 
but I could ride. <laughs> you know, we were outnumbered. I'm, I'm, I'm not playing hero. Um, so to me, it never, it never got better as far as how they looked at us. Yeah, there's always one or two people that are going to say, hey, we understand your plight, um, you know, and, and we feel for you. But the majority of Oneata, you know, you, we're, we're outsiders. We're coming in. So you might have people who, you know, their grandparents know each other. You know, hey, Jeb, remember, you know, so they know each other. But I, I'm, I'm, as far as they're concerned, we're all city kids. You know, we're all city kids. The, um, it, it, the situation did decline, uh, the, the re relationship, in, in some measure, and evidenced by only one metric. The, um, the, the, the mayor said, called them uh, uh, transients. You, it was a transient African-American population, like there were nomads <laughs> moving through the desert. And, um, and people were very angry that it, they thought it would affect their property values, uh, that no one would want to move to only on to the schools, very upset because it thought that it, uh, its enrollment would decline, its African enrollment, the subsidy enrollment would decline. But the metric was that the uh, Queen's Clavin of the Ku Klux Klan um, was monitoring the media, including the New York Times, 60 Minutes you saw. And so they decided that they would come to down because this would be a fertile area between the state police and the white residents who were so upset with the blacks that, that th this would be just a good area to recruit adherents. And so they came to town, they distributed literature. And I, my, my assumption is, though I, I don't know anything more than this, my assumption is that these were good people in Oneonta in a situation that they just didn't know what to do. But one of the things they probably did know is once they were being aligned with the Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> that was not a group they were comfortable joining. So uh, they were pretty, so I, I don't think the Klan made any, any um, any gains there, but, but it was enough so that they thought that this would be an area that would be supportive of their initiatives. And just to modern or current day, um, there's a lot of people still in the town that uh, immediately get defensive about the topic. Um, they just immediately feel like this film is going to portray them in a negative light. Um, but I think now that it is 22 years later, um, they are starting to see this isn't something I have to be ashamed of because of something people did 22 years ago that weren't me. Um, you know, ex with the police chief, uh, you know, immediately when this film was announced, um, I, I got some emails from uh, former police officers there or current police officers there, very upset about the film being made. And, you know, now that the mayor or now that the police chief has seen it, he's, he said in it, he said, you know, just because someone did this 22 years ago, I shouldn't have to immediately defend myself. What we do now is good police work, and I shouldn't feel like because of something somebody did 22 years ago that I have to uh, immediately defend what they did. Um, the newspaper was in support of the students, I, I believe. Um, the Daily Star there is, is the local newspaper. Um, they gave me full access, and from my analyzing of the articles, it seemed like they were more in, more in favor of the students. And um, you know, immediately, Bo reached out to the bigger media, um, and, and that's something I'm actually intrigued. What your guys' thoughts are, just because while I was filming this, the big thing was Occupy Wall Street was the big protest that was getting all this media attention. Um, you know, it's social media. That was. What do you think would have happened in 1990? Like, how much bigger do you think the protests would have gone if social media and television was a bigger medium? It, I, I think it would have been much, much larger because immediately something happens. You know, uh, you tweet, <laughs> and then it gets retweeted and retweeted, or you put it on Facebook, um, Snapshot. So you know, police officers pulling you over and looking at your hands, your friend snapshotting and sending it immediately. So it gets repeated. It goes on Facebook again, it gets repeated. The, the Twitter pictures of you putting your hands up. So I, it would have spread, you know, like wildfire. There, there's no way it wouldn't have been much larger than it was back then. I, the saving grace was that the internet was so small then, you know, that it was, it didn't really take off. But I, I imagine it would have been far more uh, intense uh, a lot more uh, people would have gotten involved. I could see, in my mind, I could see a larger crowd protesting. I could see more media being there. And I, I could see more immediacy as far as only not to taking action. Because, you know, when only a couple of people are looking at you, you're going to do some stuff, right? Because I know right now my son's on vacation with my wife. He's doing some stuff that I can't see, right? <laughs> so if I'm there, he's not going to do those things. So I imagine 
when every paper and every media outlet is looking at you, you're going to change the way you do things. You're going you're gonna to denounce things a lot louder than you did um, because it's so quiet, you know, and, and it's print, you know. A lot of people see a headline and throw it down, but they'll read Facebook all day. Right. They'll read Twitter all day. I know because they do it. I see them do it all the time. I, th I think that's right. The, the, the first uh, story that, that got everyone's attention was in the New York Times. Uh, because, but the, the first story in the New York Times was fascinating. It was a, it was, it was almost like, can you look what they, it was? This, it was a soft news story. It was look what they do in Oni <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then another, a, a separate New York Times reporter. Apparently, they read their own, own stuff. Said, "Are you kidding?" <laughs> and so the next article was in that metro section in Oneonta, a big article on how inappropriate, but the first one was just a study in human behavior in a small, you know, college town. And I, I can't, you're right, I, I think it would have been, it would have been uh, huge. much, much more um, dramatic. And maybe that's why the state police felt that they were immune from criticism because of that. And they were sort of in a capsule. Okay. Uh, one more question. Hi, um, I want to say thanks to all three of you for your participation in this, first of all. Um, I think about those other 100, was there 125 students? Yes. There were a lot we didn't see. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your efforts to try to talk to any of those others that we didn't see? Do you have anything you could share? Anything interesting, um, profound? Maybe a lot of them didn't want to be in this film? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I tried my hardest to find out, but my immediate response was because, again, Bo made such an impact on these kids, was to immediately go to Bo and ask him, who should I be reaching out to? Uh, I did the same with uh, Dr. Omara, the woman with the purple streak. Uh, she was really the, the main mentor for this project. Uh, they kind of pinpointed me to the people that were the true activists in it, the people that were the leaders in it. So that's how I found Kirk. Uh, that's how I found most of the people that were interviewed in this. Um, you know, there were people that declined. There were people who told me I needed to give them fifty thousand uh, dollars if they wanted me to talk. Uh, <laughs> I that's, did not that's have more that. Than I guess, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, the the one I found the most interesting was Ricky, uh, Ricky Brown, the one who uh, eventually would uh, serve as um, second. Um, Losing words right now. Second, Se second seat uh, at the court case. Um, Ricky at first said no. Uh, it was just something that he had put in the back of his mind, uh, and he just didn't want to draw back up. It just brought back too much stress and emotions on him. And you know, I, I emailed and said, "Please let me know if you're ever interested," because he was very important to the whole story. Uh, he eventually emailed me months later and said, "You know, I'm starting to think about it more. I feel like it might be good to get this off my chest." But he basically challenged me. He said, why, why should I be telling you the story? What makes you important to the story? Um, and to be honest with you, I respected that, uh, maybe even more than some of the people who immediately said, sure, what time and where, um, for him to really want to make sure that his story was safe with someone. Um, so you know, he, he drove from Boston uh, and, and met with me and did the interview. Um, he described it as a few other people did as a therapy session. Uh, I tried not to ask questions during the interview process uh, with him. I kind of just pressed record and said, tell me your story, expecting maybe 15, 20 minutes of talking to be done. Every person talked for about an hour and a half um, without missing, a without even breathing, just kept going. Um, so, you know, the, I respect people not wanting to bring it up again. Uh, this is something that they've really kind of pushed back to their mind just so they couldn't, wouldn't have to think about it. But uh, I'm, I'm, I think the people that I did find are the perfect examples of how you would want individuals to, and not even individuals, uh, they're kids, they're 18 years old, uh, to, to respond this way. Uh, you have to think the year after this was the LA riots, this immediate uh, response to having violence as, as your answer. These kids said that they wanted to go th proceed through the, court, uh, through the courts, do it properly. Uh, they wanted to have scholarships for other students. I think that is one of the most amazing things in this story, uh, to not want money out of this, want to ha uh, make scholarships available for other people. I think it's outstanding. But uh, I guess we'll wrap it up now. I just want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you to Scott and Kirk. Thanks, Sean, and thank you, Scott. And uh...
Final thank you to the Sanctuary, and uh, I believe the New York Civil Liberties Union is around here tonight um, if you want to talk to them too. Uh, thank you very much.